Um, okay, look, um, what I want to do is just continue on a little bit with what we've been talking about in terms of prayer, uh, and particularly prayer and uh, the will of God. We spent a few weeks uh, talking about um, this, and uh, I just want to carry on a little bit from where we, we've been going, talking about Jesus, uh, the Lord, what we've known as the Lord's Prayer, and that's where Jesus uh, was teaching his disciples how to pray, and he started by uh, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, and then he says, Your kingdom come, your will be done. And he's showing them that the basis of prayer is, of course, the will of God. And so we've been looking at uh, prayer. We've been looking at how, what Jesus taught his disciples about prayer. Again, let me preface, the idea is not to talk about prayer. The idea is not to uh, pump up our tires about prayer. The idea is that each of us here would be getting active in the place of prayer. Amen? That we would be actually praying. Jesus, when, when, when he was approached by his disciples and asked about prayer, teach us to pray. They were saying, we know that prayer is something you do. Teach us how to do this. It wasn't just fill our head with some great information. No, no, we realize prayer is an action. Who knows that? Prayer is an action. Prayer is a sacrifice, is it not? It's a sacrifice on our part. Uh, for many people, our prayer life is not a sacrifice. The, the, the great sacrifice is I just turn the radio off while I'm driving to work and I'll talk to God instead of the radio. And there's nothing wrong with that. Is that prayer? Of course it is. You're talking to God. Or, or while I'm vacuuming, cleaning my house, I'll, I'll pray to God. But I think there's something where if we look at the life of Jesus and the life of the early church, prayer was something they did and it was also something that they set time aside for. It was something that they did undistractedly where that's what I'm there for. It's not something I'm doing while I'm doing this. They sought God and they prayed. And the power of God was so evident in the early church. Uh, and prayer was one of those foundational things that was a part of their world. And if we want to be like the early church, and I don't know everybody here, but I know that when I read those stories, I, I, anyone ever found a use-by date on the promises of God? I can't find a use by date. I read about a God that healed the sick, that raised the dead, that cleansed lepers. I, I read about, about the power of God upon human beings like you and me. And when they preached and talked about Jesus, people didn't just laugh in the street and walk by. They stopped and they fell on their knees and they said, what must I do to be saved? I mean, there was something powerful on the lives of these people, these, these early believers in Jesus. And if I'm brutally honest, I examine my own life and go, I don't feel like I've got all that happening in my world. I don't feel like the power of God is flowing through me like it did through them. And it would be easy to try to find a passage that justifies my lack of, of, of closeness with God or my lack of uh, seeing God move through me to that degree. And I'm not saying that uh, I'm them. They were, well, they were them and I'm me. But what I know is this. I feel like there's, there's stuff that God has for me that I'm not flowing in yet. Anyone else feel that way? There are opportunities that God wants to open for me, doors that haven't opened yet. Uh, and I, I know that a lot of my relationship with God and a lot of these things are only ever going to crack open by getting in the place of prayer. There's a lot of things around the world that I believe God wants to change, but I believe he calls us to co-work with him, to co-create with him by playing our part in that, and that is by putting time aside and praying. And so we can't escape the fact that prayer is a really, really important part of our Christian journey. Do I like that idea? Not really. I'd rather just be watching sport. I'd rather be listening to music, mowing my lot. I'd rather be doing all those other things, sleeping in every morning. But I can't escape the fact that when I open up these ancient documents, prayer slaps me in the face on just about every page. Amen? It's there. And so prayer is something that we want to do, not something we just want to understand and read about and go, oh, wasn't that a great point? We want to be doing it. We want to be doing it. So 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, it says this. It says, now this is the confidence that we have in him, speaking of God. This is the confidence that we have in God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we ask of him. What a bold and confident thing for John to write to the people that he was writing to. What an incredibly bold statement to make. Now, this is the confidence that we have. This is the confidence we have. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, how many of you know that you can take that to a complete extreme and turn it into something other than what John is trying to say? 
How many of you have seen people will take the Word of God and will take it to an extremity that actually takes the very life out of the Word of God and we're trying to make it mean something that suits our purpose. We try to make it mean something that meets the desires of my flesh and take it out of the context of the Word of God. And we have whole movements within Christianity that have taken statements like this to the extreme edge and uh, now we've got these, anyone ever heard of name it and claim it? where you just name whatever you want. Well, how can you do that? Well, I can do that because this is what John said. If you ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, then whenever we ask, we know we have it. And then there'll be other passages that people will take. John 16, 24. Until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. So just ask anything in the name of Jesus and you can have anything you want. I've sat through messages where I've heard preachers say that, that you don't have everything in your will because you just haven't asked for it. All you've got to do is ask and God is like a tap. You just tell him what you want, put in your couple of coins and out comes whatever it is that you put the coins in for. You can just have it. It's like God on tap. Matthew 18, 19. Jesus said this, Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it'll be done for them by my Father in heaven. If two of you agree concerning anything, isn't that an awesome promise? Okay, how many of you agree that by next Sunday we shouldn't be wearing masks in church and we should have about 120 people seated here? Who agrees with me? All I need is one other person, two of us, then guess what? It's going to happen. How many of us agree that coronavirus has had its time and it should just disappear from the earth? Anyone agree with me on that? Great, there's four or five of us. So according to what some people believe about that, coronavirus is gone. Let's clap our hands. Awesome. Woo, no more corona. Why? Because two of us agreed. And if we agree on anything, we can have everything we want. How many of you would agree with me? The West Tigers deserve to win a grand final next year. Peter Phelps, you'll agree with me. Amen. So it's going to happen. Sorry, all you other supporters of the other 15 teams. It's going to be a wasted year for you. Because we agreed. But we know that that's not exactly what Jesus is getting at. We know that that's not what prayer is. Prayer is not something whereby we, we place demands on God. It's, it's, some, some people treat prayer like, we, you know when you go to a restaurant? Have you go to a restaurant? And, and you sit down. We went to a beautiful restaurant the other night. And you sit down. And, 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 and here's the thing. You know why they have a menu? Because it's the will of the chef. And if you ask for anything according to the will of the chef, you'll get it. So if you ask for anything on the menu, guess what? You'll get it. Why? Because it's the will of the chef. You can't just walk into a Chinese restaurant uh, and, and say, look, can I have your, your best spaghetti bolognese? Thank you. And they're going to look at you and go, well, we don't serve spaghetti bolognese. You have to go to the Italian restaurant for spaghetti bolognese. But what we do serve is we got all this Asian food. So anything on that menu, whatever's there, whatever's written, if you ask for that, you can have that and you can place your order, turn, continue the conversation and in great faith know that eventually that thing is going to come into your lap. Well, some people kind of treat prayer like that, don't they? It's like we can just have whatever we want. But what I love about the passage in John is that John kind of quantifies it a little bit and he brings it back to what Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus said, uh, uh, your will be done. John says, now this is the confidence we have if we ask not anything, but he says if we ask anything according to his will. If we ask anything that's in alignment with what God desires. That's what that word will means, the desire, the preconceived uh, desire of, of, of the one with the will. So anything that, that God has desired and determined and wants to happen, if we pray in line with the will of God, that he, he, anyone play cricket here? Any cricketers here? A couple of cricketers up the back. Ruth? I don't think that's true, but anyway, let's imagine Ruth did play cricket. Um, you, know, you know, you see on the, on the TV, they talk about the batting average, and the higher the batting average, the better the batter is, you know? Well, it's almost like John saying, if you want to increase your batting average when it comes to prayer, in terms of getting uh, uh, answers to prayer, if you want to increase your average, then here's the key to increasing your average in prayer. Start praying in line with the will of God. Start praying in line with the will of God, and your average will go up because God has made a commitment that he will answer and give all things when they're prayed in line with his will and in line with his purpose. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't just pray for what we, what we need and what we want and so on because here's the thing. The will of a loving father is to bless his children. That's part of the will of God as well is that a loving father wants to bless his children. 
I've had my children ask me for things that didn't cross my mind to want to give them, but they wanted something, and I look at it and go, well, that fits in with the framework of what they want. Johnny wants a grenade. I'm probably not going to give him a grenade. Johnny, you're a wild boy. You'll probably throw it at your brothers. So you're not going to get a grenade, Johnny. It's not in line with my will. But Johnny, want, you want this book? Oh, yeah, that sounds good. I wasn't thinking, yeah, I'll give you that. No worries, that's fine. Because it's still within the line of my will for my child. And so we can bring all our requests and all this stuff to God. But as we go on in prayer, what, we, what, what Jesus is trying to teach his disciples is that prayer is, just, is not you rocking up to the counter with a shopping list. There's more to prayer. That's one element of prayer. Bring all that stuff to But there's a deeper element of prayer. And that's where we co-create with God to bring his will to pass down here on earth. God has the power. The majesty does the miracles. But we bring the prayer. And we call it. And we speak it out. And we pave a way in the spiritual dimension through our prayers, offering them up to God. That's what prayer is. And John says here, if you ask anything according to the will of God, anything according to the will of God, The reason that 1 John 5 is so powerful when it comes to prayer is because he reintroduces us to the most powerful key in prayer, which is this point, according to your will. Who would love to uh, see in their own personal world an increase in the average or the percentage, I guess, of prayers where you're praying and you're able to connect the dots and go, no, there's no way that wasn't God. There's no way that wasn't God. I mean, I was praying and and that happened, just like we just heard from Fleur. You know, Christians, I'm not saying there's no such thing as coincidence and chance. But I'm telling you what, they're extremely overused words in the church. They're extremely overused words in the church. We believe in a miracle working God, a powerful God. We commit things to him. Things happen. And it's so natural for so many, even believers, to not link the answer to the prayer and to God, but to link the answer to chance and consequence. And when we do that, God gets robbed of glory down here. God gets robbed of glory down here on earth. So I want us to, to, to up our average when it comes to prayer, so to speak. And I know this, according to what Jesus taught and according to what John's saying here, if we learn to pray in line with the will of God, then we're going to begin to see more answers to prayers. We're going to begin to see more things change and more things happen. So the will of God in prayer is a really, really important thing. So prayer is about bringing the will of God to earth and prayer according to God's will is always answered. Then where can we find the will of God? How do we actually know the will of God? Well, I want you to go to the book of Acts with me, chapter 16. There's a little story in there. And and for me, this story displays how to find the will of God in the most simplistic way possible of any other thing I find in the Bible. Acts chapter 16. It's a story of of, of Paul and a bunch of his his mates, and they're all going on a missionary uh, journey. They're going out into all the world to preach the gospel. In Acts chapter 16, verse 6 to 10, it says this. It says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. What an amazing story when it comes to trying to understand this thing called the will of God. So if we're going to pray the will of God, right, then we want to understand what is the will of God. And the way we discover the will of God in prayer is kind of similar to the way we discover the will of God in life. Now let me preface by saying this. When I talk about the will of God, my, my slant on the big picture will of God is probably a bit different to what, what maybe a lot of other people have heard and read. I think sometimes we obsess too much in our own personal world. We obsess about the will of God. As if the will of God for your individual personal life is the eye of a needle. And if I miss it, it's all over. Sometimes we obsess about the will of God as if the world will stop spinning on its axis if I don't find the will of God for my life. Because I'm that important that the will of God for my life is so crucial. You know what? I encourage people, don't don't sit there and stress uh, about going to God, what's the will of God for my life? I would rather wake up each day and say, God, today, how does my life fit into your will? Wherever I am, at work, at school, whatever it is that I find myself doing, God, how does my life fit into your will today? Because it doesn't matter where I am. How many of you know God's doing stuff? 
God's moving throughout the world. God is moving on the university campuses. God is moving in the schoolyard. God is moving in the business sector. He is moving in, in education. He is moving in the hospital system. God is moving in all these places. God is doing things. And sometimes when we obsess on what's the will of God for my life, how many opportunities are we missing? Because we're just stressing about the will of God and we don't want to miss it because it's the eye of a needle. How many opportunities are going past us every single day where we're not listening to the Holy Spirit and we're not engaging with him and we're not stepping into opportunities and things that are right there in front of us because we're too busy stressing about the will of God. What if we all just woke up and said, you know what, I'm just going to live today as if I'm smack bang in the middle of the will of God and I'm just going to say, God, how does my life fit into your will? Because God, you're doing something today. It's not just about me. You know, I'm a speck of dust in this human existence, aren't I? I'm going to come and I'm going to go. And I may get 10 years, 20 years, 50. I may live to be 100. I don't know how long I'm going to live. But one day I'm going to move on from here and be with Jesus. And hopefully here, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your rest. But one day I'll be gone. Now, when I disappear, God's not going to sit back, call a boardroom meeting and say, okay, Alan's gone, let's retweet the plan. What are we doing? How are we going to cope? Al's not there. We need someone to... God's not going to do that because God's got like a, 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 a big panoramic view of the beginning to the end and he knows what he's doing all the way along and what he's looking for is people that he can go each day, each moment, each place, go, I need something done. Who's available? You're available. I'm going to tap you on the shoulder. Would you do this right now? If you don't, that's fine. I'll move on. I'll tap somebody else on the shoulder and say, would you do this for me right now? I've often said to my wife, you know, I don't actually believe that what I'm doing and have done, I was first called to. I I just have this feeling that my father was called to it. But for whatever reason, my dad didn't take up that call. I've always had this sense, God, I was not your first choice. Somebody else was your first choice, whether it was my dad or my granddad. I've always had this sense that God just waited patiently and he picked me, but, 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 but I wasn't necessarily first choice. I don't care about that. I just want to know that each day I'm making a difference for the kingdom of God because at the end of the day, that's the only thing that's going to last. The kingdoms of this earth will pass away. All my money will disappear. All my reputation on earth will disappear. All the things that I buy and purchase will fade, rust and disappear. But what I do for the kingdom of God will go on throughout eternity. And I want to know that my life counts for eternity. And I I hope and pray that you want your life to count for eternity as well. So in this story, we we, we see a a practical example of how is it that that we can can find the will of God. Because if we know what the will of God is, generally we can pray the will of God. And there's a couple of very, very simple, three very simple uh, points and things in this story that will help us on this journey of discovering the will of God, not just the way we live, but we're talking specifically about prayer, things that we can pray, that we can pray in confidence and know that they are the will of God. And the first thing is this, the will of God can be found in the word of God. The will of God is found in the word of God. Isn't it a funny story? Isn't this a really funny story? You've got a group of well-seasoned Jesus followers who have seen miracles, signs, wonders, raised the dead. I mean, by Acts 16, they've got a pretty full resume, amen? They've got a pretty full-on resume of things outside the human box that they've participated in and done and seen and God has worked through them. They've got a pretty good resume by Acts chapter 16. Yet here they are just getting up one day and it says they started heading in a direction. And then the Holy Spirit, it says, forbid them to go in the direction they were going. So what do they do? Well, they just turned around and went off in another direction. And it says for a second time, the Spirit forbid them going there as well. What were they doing? It's painfully obvious that they didn't sit down and have a a, a one-week prayer session to ask the Lord, where should we go, Lord? Give us the direction. Or if they did, they didn't hear him very well. Because twice he had to get in their path and go, ah, wrong, ah, wrong, change direction. You're going in the wrong direction. (laughs) You know what I think? I don't think they sat down and prayed. I think what they did is they remembered the words of Jesus when he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And they got out a map and said, well, that's part of all the world. We don't need to ask Jesus, should we preach the gospel in all the world? He's told us to preach the gospel in all the world. So we're just going to pull up stumps and head into all the world. And we're just going to start telling people in all the world about Jesus. In other words, they're just going to do what the word of God already told them to do. They're just going to do what God has already said to do. Don't you love it when your kids do what they know to do? 
I'm getting some blank stares from some parents. Obviously, your kids haven't learnt yet to just simply do what they know to do. You know when they're really small and you've got to, every day you sort of got to take them in the room and say, look, clean your room, make your bed, then come. And then the next day, say, clean your room, or, or go and brush your teeth, and, and every day brush. And, and, you know, we do that for a period, don't we? But there's something glorious about that moment where you stop every day having to tell them the same thing because they just realise this is just the right thing to do. So they just start getting into the habit of just doing the right thing to do and not having to be retold all the time. You know, nobody wants an 18, and if, if this is you, I'm not judging you, but nobody wants an 18, 19 year old, and you've got to tell them every morning, go and brush your teeth. Nobody wants that. And it's worse when you say, it's too late for that, that ship's passed, go and shave your teeth. Nobody wants that. You don't want to still be saying at 21, hey, can you just go and clean your room? Can you just make your bed? Can you put your dish in? There's simple things that we just, we drill them in. And, and, and what happens, a child grows up and the child one day goes, I know the will of my parents. They don't have to keep telling me to do that. I just know that this is what pleases them. So I'm just going to start doing it. I'm just going to start doing it. It's a great moment. So there are some things that the early church just knew to do. And I believe this was one of those moments. They just got up and said, we're just going to do what we know to do. We don't need to be told again to do it because Jesus told us to do it. And we know this is something that we just should be doing. So we're going to go into all the world and we're going to preach the gospel. So just as there are some things we already know to do, there are also some things that we've already been told to pray for. I mean, you know that. The Word of God already gives us some things. So, so if you're a person in here right now and you don't regularly pray, you don't have a regular prayer life, then I'm going to give you a few things here that you can write down as a starting point to begin to get a bit of a prayer life happening consistently for you. Here are some simple, basic things that we've already been told that we should be praying for. All right? 2 Peter 3.9 says this. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's the will of God that none should perish. Amen? It's the will of God that all should come to repentance. Amen? So there's a good starting point. Let's pray for people who are lost. Why don't you start praying for people that don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ? friends, family, neighbours, people that you know that right now are living alienated from the life of God, why don't you start praying for them? Because Peter tells us that it's the will of God that none of those people should perish. It's the will of God that every one of them should come to repentance. So why don't we start praying for people that we don't know? I wonder if I asked around this room this week, how many prayers have been prayed specifically for people that don't know Jesus? I wonder how many names we would end up with on a board. Now, if we were all praying by name for three or four people each week that we didn't know, each morning we lifted two or three different people that don't know the Lord, guess what? That board would be really, really full. But I just wonder how many people do we pray for? We know it's the will of God that none would perish, we know it's the will of God that all would come to repentance. So let's start praying for people that don't know the Lord. Amen? It's a simple one. It's a practical one. But you, we're trying to get from zero, from drive to first to second to third in our prayer life. Well, here are some things that will get you from drive or from park into first gear. Pray for people that don't know Jesus. Matthew 9, 38, Jesus said this. He said, therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Second thing you could be praying for. How many of you pray that God would send people into the harvest field of Lismore? How many of you this week have, have prayed a prayer and said, Lord, there are, there are, there are about 80,000 people in our region, probably 79,000 of them don't know you, Lord. It's a big mission field. It's a massive mission field. And, and, and Lord, you told the disciples to pray for God to send out laborers, to kick them out. In, in the Greek language, um, uh, when, when Jesus speaks to his disciples uh, and, and, and sends them out, I think it's in Luke, it says that he sent out the 70. Remember that passage? He sent out the 70 to go everywhere and to preach. That word sent out is the Greek word ekbolo. It's the exact same word used when Jesus would confront a demon and he would ekbolo the demon. He would send it out. There was a definite determination and almost an aggression, a, a, a seriousness about when Jesus confronted a demon and he dealt with it. He dealt with it. He was serious about it. It's the same word when he sent the 72 out. 
And so, so this week, how many of us, if we were to do a, a, put a board up, how many of us in this room that call on the name of Jesus have prayed once that God would send a laborer into Lismore, into the harvest fields around us, to share with somebody, to meet a need in the name of Jesus? Well, Jesus said, pray. He said, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers. So pray for the lost. Here you go. You want to get from park to first gear? Start praying for the lost. Start praying for laborers to be sent into the harvest field. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 2. It says, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. If I was to get a whiteboard up here right now and say to each of us, how many of us this week have prayed for the rulers and those who are in authority? I'll tell you what's happening at the moment. Many, many voices are criticizing them. I know that. You jump on social media, you jump on the news. It doesn't matter what, it wouldn't matter what what a leader did these days. Somebody's going to bag them. It doesn't matter who that leader is. Anybody in a position of authority these days, we're anti-authority, anti-establishment. We don't like. It doesn't matter whether, even in politics, somebody comes up with a great idea, the opposition will resist it. Why? Because they didn't come up with it. Even though it's a fantastic idea. I think we should change the way we call things in parliament. Stop calling the other guys the opposition for a start. What a dumb name. What a dumb name. We're already telling them straight away, you're the opposition, so whatever we do, you're going to oppose it. Stop it. Come on. But we're told here as a church that we're called, we're encouraged, we should be praying for our leaders. Praying for, we've got elections coming up in a couple of weekends' time. Let's start praying for our leaders. God, would you get the right people in the right places when these elections come about? Instead of criticizing everything, it's so easy to pick apart and criticize what people don't do right. But yet the word of God tells us you don't criticize your leaders. Pray for your leaders. Pray for those who are in authority. You may not agree with them. That's fine. But you don't carry the pressure they carry either. So pray for them. Pray for them. If you read the broader context here, you read verse 1 to verse 4, it seems to me that what he's specifically telling us to do is pray that they would encounter Christ and come to faith. Because he goes on and he says we're praying for them so that we, the church, can live a peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. And the only way that that's going to happen, if you read the context, is if we have Christian leaders, then of course the church can live in incredible uh, freedom and liberty and so on. But when we have non-Christian leaders, it's very hard to live in a society like that. And we see that all around the world. Leaders who are anti-gospel, anti-Jesus, anti-church, those churches don't live in the kind of peace that he's asking us to pray for. But he says, pray for your leaders. Don't be so critical all the time of them. They are not perfect and they will get things wrong. But we need to pray for them. I wonder, here's one. I wonder how many people here pray for your church leaders? How many of you pray for us? I know know a handful of people do. I'm saying this is what he's saying. Pray for the rulers, leaders and all those who are in authority. I can tell you what I do just about, I won't say every day because that would be a lie. But just about every day, I pray for every person in this room. And everybody that calls their eyes home, I pray for you. I lift you up before God. And as the church gets bigger, it's harder. But you know, there'll be certain days where the Lord will drop certain names. And so we'll pray specifically for certain names. But we have a commitment here. We pray as pastors, Alan and Jackie, uh, Ruth and Daniel, we get together every Thursday night and we, we sit down as pastors and we pray for you. Every Thursday night, we are praying for you. We are praying for the hand of God upon your life. We're praying for blessing. We're praying uh, uh, for prosperity. We're praying that you f- you'll connect with the purpose of God for your life. We're praying that you'll, 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 you'll hear the voice of God. We're praying you'll feel the presence of God. We're, we're praying for you in difficult moments. We, we get together and we pray for you. And, and, and this, this verse here is a bit of a challenge to us to pray for those who are over us as well. But, but I'd ask you, pray for us. Would you remember to pray for us as, as rules, leaders, authorities, call it whatever you want, but pray for us, pray for us. We're, 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 we're doing what we do, not in our own strength. We don't, we don't have the strength and wisdom. We're not smart enough to do what we do. We need God just like you do to do the things that you do. So pray for your leaders so we can be praying for the lost. Pray for workers to go into the harvest. Pray for our leaders. In Matthew chapter 5, and I don't like this one, and you probably won't either, but don't stone me. Matthew five forty four. but I say to you, love your enemies. Woo! Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. You know what that word means literally in the Greek? Bless those who curse you? It means speak well of those who are speaking bad of you. Isn't that hard? I mean, that's hard, isn't it? You know, somebody's out there bad-mouthing you and they come up to you, you know what such and such said about you? And you go, what, really? Well, you should see the size of their toes. Or whatever it is, you know. We want to fire back. 
He said what it means is they come up and say, you know, such and such has been saying this about you. And you turn and go, really? Oh, that's a shame because I think they're really nice people and they're really good. Speak well of them. But he says, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good for those who hate you, watch this and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. You've got people in your world right now that are spitefully using you? Put them on your prayer list. You've got people in your world right now that are persecuting you for your faith, ridiculing you for your faith? Add them on your prayer list. Get out of park and get into first. Start praying for these people. Pray for your enemy. So we're praying for the lost. We're praying for workers in the harvest. We're praying for our leaders. We're praying for our enemies. James 1 verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. In the context of that, he's talking about praying for wisdom in the midst of trials and difficulties. Who's going through a trial and a difficulty right now? Who's got some stuff happening in their world right now that you would classify as a trial or a difficulty? This is awesome. We've got a great church. Nobody's going through a hard thing right now. That's fantastic. I, I pray that's awesome. You're either coming out of a storm or going into a storm. That's basically what life's about, isn't it? So he says here, if you're going through trials, he says, pray for wisdom. Pray for wisdom. There's another thing you can add on your prayer list. What are the things we're going through right now, the difficulties we're facing? Well, pray for wisdom. God, I can't do this on my own strength, Lord. Or God, my solutions are my solutions, but I, 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 I don't know that they're necessarily your solutions, God. So Father, I want you to give me wisdom. Give me insight. Let me see some things I haven't seen. You know, uh, 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 Help me to have a perspective that maybe is not natural to me, but maybe you've got God, I need wisdom in this situation. We can pray for wisdom in trials. So we're praying for the lost. We're praying for workers in the harvest. We're praying for our leaders. We're praying for our enemies. We're praying for wisdom in trials. And one more, James 5, 16. It says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Confess your sins to one another. Confess your sins to one another. It's interesting that James links confessing of your sins to one another with, with the opportunity for healing to come into your world. It's interesting. It's so much easier and more comfortable to just confess my sins to God. I've got to be honest with you. It's just so much easier for me to get before the Lord and just confess my sins to God. I mean, he's the one ultimately that, that forgives me, eh? Well, I know that God forgives me. But, but it's also so much easier to confess my sins to God than get up, walk away, and do the same sin again because nobody knows about it. Only God. So I can go back to God again and confess my sins to God. Yet, yet, yet what I, I see here is that, that James is saying that if we start confessing our sins to one another, there's a vulnerability there. There's an accountability that comes in there. And, and, and somehow there's a power released in that where not only do you get forgiveness, but you can start to get healing. And let me tell you something, there are a lot of people, and you, some of you might be those people here in this room right now, where you know you can get forgiveness from God. That's why you keep going back asking. You're confident with that, but you want to get to a place where you're not just getting forgiveness all the time. I'd love healing so I don't have to get forgiveness. The wound, the hurt, whatever it is that's inside of me, the addiction, the habit, I want the power of that broken so I don't have to keep going back to God saying, oh Lord, would you forgive me? And God goes, of course I forgive you. Look what I did for you 2,000 years ago on the cross. I showed you. I showed you how willing I am to forgive you by giving my only son for you. Of course I forgive you. But don't you want more than just forgiveness? Wouldn't it be great to get healing? Well, James is linking here the confessing of our sins or our trespasses to one another and the vulnerability, that that, the vulnerability that that brings and the openness that that brings. And I also love that passage where, I think it's in Peter, where it says that God resists the proud. Read that one? That gives grace to the humble. I, 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 when, when I run through this verse in my head and I, I see it outplayed, I see somebody going to somebody saying, you know, Rod, I'm, I just want to confess to you, Rod, I'm struggling with, with this. This is a, a struggle in my life. And, uh, you know, I know, I know I'm forgiven. I know that the Lord forgives me, but, but, but Rod, I keep going back to God. Forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. I don't want to keep having to run back for forgiveness. I want healing. I want to break out of this. So Rod, I want to just confess this to you. 
And when I do that, uh, I, Rod, you pray for me. I want you to pray for me. And in that moment where, where God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble, I can almost see in the spiritual world the devil having to take his hands off and take a step back and go, whoa, what just happened? And then God comes flooding in with his grace and goes, now you get out of the way. Now let's work. Now let's bring healing. Let's break some chains. Let's break some shackles. Let's do some stuff. That's what James is getting at here. Confess your sins to one another. It takes great faith, though, to do that, doesn't it? Great vulnerability and great humility. Great humility. I often wonder, I often wonder whether that's something that we lack in the life of the church in terms of healing. We want to see miracles. We want to see signs and wonders. We want to see breakthroughs. But how badly do we want to see them? Do we want to see them to the point where we're prepared to humble ourselves and, and do what James is saying here? And actually bring into the light that which is being kept hidden in the darkness that the devil's using against us and we can't go anywhere with it because we know it's there and we're not prepared to bring it to the light to have something to fight against it. Just a thought. So if you're wanting to get from park into first gear in terms of prayer, here's just a couple of little simple things that you could be praying for each day. Give yourself 10 minutes. I mean, if you're not a regular prayer, just start with 10 minutes a day. Just 10, don't don't be unrealistic and go, I'm going to pray for two hours a day. No, because you'll fail. If you can't pray now, you're not going to do two hours. It's like the people that don't exercise at all and then say, well, I'm going to get up at at four o'clock every morning and do a two-hour run and a three-kilometer swim. No, that's dumb. Why don't you just start by saying, I'm going to get up at six o'clock and I'm going to walk to the end of my street and back. Just start somewhere. If you're not doing something, don't set a goal that's so unrealistic that you know you're going to fail. And then when you fail, you feel even worse about yourself. Don't do it. Start little. You know, from little things, big things grow. So start small. So maybe if you're in park and you want to get into drive, in the first gear, here's what I'm saying to you. Why don't you just put these little things on a prayer list and it might be just simply 10 minutes of prayer, you and God, and then get on with your day. Just you've got to begin things to see where they take you, amen? You've got to start things. Sometimes I think, and that's what I love about what Fleur was saying in, in her testimony, is they didn't just sit back and go, God, here's a problem, you fix it, and we'll get on with our life as if nothing's going on until eventually the consequences of that catch up with you or until eventually the pain of that gets so overbearing that you're forced to have to make a change when you could have made changes before you were forced to have to make them. I love that. You got up and you did the stuff, you contacted banks, you did what you could, and God gravitates that. See, God, God is drawn to our actions, not our intentions. God can't do anything with your intentions, but he can do a lot when you start moving. He can do a lot with your actions. So here's what you're going to do. You're just going to start getting out of into first gear by just these simple little things. Pray for the lost. You're going to pray for workers in the harvest. You're going to pray for your leaders. You're going to pray for your enemies. And you're going to pray for wisdom in any difficulty that you're facing right now. If you start doing that, if you begin doing that, then at least you begin to put a little bit of motion towards this little thing called prayer. And trust me, if you get a consistent commitment Committed prayer life, your life will change. That is my ironclad, guaranteed promise to you. There's something powerful about prayer, and we need to tap back into it. Somewhere along the line, we forgot about prayer. Why? Because we've got Greek and Hebrew texts now. We understand more about God. We've got concordances, and we've got scientific breakthroughs, and we've got uh, political clout, and we've got, and we've just got all this stuff. We can put a man on the moon. We can microwave a meal in three minutes. We, I mean, the world is so full of stuff that we can do. Somewhere along the lines, we got so self-reliant, and maybe that's sort of happened in the church too we get a bit self-reliant I think it's time we come back to the basic simple things of what got this movement started this movement we're a part of called the way called the church amen and prayer was one of those things so Father I want to thank you for this morning thank you for your word God I want to thank you that God your word is so simple when we uncomplicate it in our head And Father, I just pray this morning, if there are people here and they haven't got a a consistent prayer life, they haven't uh, maybe even even thought about finding the time to do that or whatever, or God never really looked at your word from that perspective, what, what, help me, God, what could we pray for? What should we be praying for? Then Father, I just pray this morning, Lord, that you would speak to those people. I pray that, Lord, you would, uh, Holy Spirit, just motivate them, just put a little fire in their heart, put a little fire in their heart to just begin this journey of prayer. Begin praying and begin uh, uh, bringing to you those things that you've already told us to pray for, Father. Would you just stir in our hearts, God, and call us back to that place of, of simple faith. God, pray in line with the will of God and trust 
that God will do something with that. And Father, I pray for, uh, Lord, the rest of this week as we go from here, Lord, would you keep us safe? God, would you bless us? I pray spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, God, financially, would you have your hand upon our life? And Lord, I also ask, God, in the next seven days, give each one of us an opportunity to talk to somebody outside the walls of this building. God, there's somebody out there that's struggling, that's, that's needing answers. God, there's somebody out there, and we know that you can meet the need, the deepest needs of their heart. And we pray this week, God, would you give each of us the opportunity to bump into that person and to share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. And Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you guys. Um, Tea and coffee, as usual, next door. Don't feel like you've got to run off. Uh, And uh, please, uh, if we can get that slide back up there, Luke, uh, for next Saturday. Uh, Those of you that would love to come and join with the family and help celebrate a great life in Jeff Pinnock, that would be great.